Hello, everybody. This is Chapter 8, the Skeletal System, continuing, and we are doing the Appendicular Skeleton. Okay, so the appendicular skeleton is made up of 126 bones and is primarily involved for movement. Uh, as the appendages to the central skeleton, these bones include the shoulder girdle, the upper limbs, the pelvic girdle, and the lower limbs. The uh, two pectoral girdles include the clavicle and the scapula. And the uh, Scapula is that flat bone on your back that um, meets up with the clavicle and the humerus. The clavicle uh, inserts into the sternoclavicular joint of the sternum. And then on, on the lateral side, uh, acromioclavicular joint. So the clavicle is an S-shaped bone. Uh, it's got a medial or a sternal end that articulates with the manubrium, and then the lateral or acromial end that articulates with the acromion of the scapula. So you can see the, the medial end, and the lateral end. The scapula is a flat bone that's located in the superior part of the posterior thorax between the second and seventh ribs. Its glenoid cavity right here is the attachment point for the humerus, for the head of the humerus. It fits right into the glenoid cavity. And we've got a coracoid process, some spines, and a acrimonium process as well as the lateral border into the inferior angle. Here is the scapula again, showing the subscapular fossa, the medial or uh, vertebral border, and the lateral uh, or the axillary border. And there's an inferior angle uh, up at the top, you've got a superior angle, superior border, and a scapular notch, as well as the chromion, the coracoid process, and then the glenoid cavity, as we mentioned. So the humerus um, articulates with the scapula uh, with this head that fits into the glenoid cavity. And... Uh, on its distal end, it articulates with the radius and the ulna, the trochlea of the uh, humerus articulates with the coronoid process of the radius. We'll go more into these uh, fa fossa and epicondyles. Okay, so the ulna and the radius are the two bones of the forearm. The radius is going to be lateral. The ulna is going to be medial. And then in between these two is an interosseous membrane. So the head of the ulna articulates with the styloid process of the radius and into the carpals of the hand. Here, once again, we see the ulna with its olecranon process that fits into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. And this is the posterior view. So the olecranon and the coronoid process at the proximal end of the ulna form the trochlear notch, which wraps around the trochlea of the humerus, making up the main elbow joint. So we've got the ulna here, the olecranon process, the trochlear notch, and the coronary process. And then of the radius, we've got the head of the radius. 
this is the proximal, or these are the proximal ends that articulate with the humerus. Okay, another view of this, we've got the humerus going distally with this uh, trochlea, and that is articulating with the coronoid process, as well as the capitulum articulating with the head of the radius. And clearly this interosseous membrane can be seen holding those two bones together. Okay, we take uh, a different view. Um, this is the inferior view of the distal ends of the radius and the ulna. Here we can see uh, the articulation for the scaphoid, the styloid process, as well as articulation for the lunate uh, ulnar notch of the radius, the head of the ulna, and the styloid process of the ulna. So once again, this is an inferior view of the distal ends of the radius and the ulna as they're going to articulate with the scaphoid and lunate bones. So here uh, is another look at uh, the ulna with this olecranon uh, and the trochlear notch, uh, coronoid process, the radial notch, ulnar tuberosity, Okay, we move uh, distally to the hand. Um, there are a number of carpals which articulate with the radius and the ulna. These carpals, you can apply a mnemonic. So um, stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hand. Uh, that could stand for scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hand. Scaphoid, stop, lunate, letting, triquitrum, those, pisiform, people, trapezium, touch, trapezoid, the, capitate, cadavers, hamate, hand. So that's the... Uh, best way to learn this, uh, there's a proximal row is where we start with uh, the scaphoid and a distal row where we start with the trapezium. So all together there are eight small bones uh, connected by ligaments arranged in two rows. If we move distally we've got our uh, metacarpals. Metacarpals are a little bit easier than the carpals. They are simply numbered one through five, starting uh, medially. I'm sorry, starting laterally in the anatomical position and moving medially. And distal to the metacarpals are the phalanges. Now the phalanges have um, a proximal, a middle, and a distal end, uh, except for the thumb. That's gonna be your first uh, metacarpal, but the thumb is missing the middle portion. So it's got the proximal and distal phalanges, and then the other four fingers um, moving medially in the anatomical position will lead to uh, proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. Okay, so uh, we've done the hand and uh, the shoulder. Now let's go to the hip. So the pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones, um, the oscoxa and the coxal bones that articulate with the sacrum anteriorly. Here they're shown in green. 
And each hip bone is actually made up of three individual bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, which we're going to see on the next slide. So after the three bones, the ilium, ischium, and pubis fuse, then it's referred to as the os, coxa, um, coxal, or the hip bone. Those are the three different names for this green bone here. And the two bones articulate anteriorly uh, at the pubic uh, symphysis, which is a, a, a disc of cartilage between uh, the two bones. And that's a fibrocartilage disc. Okay, so we take the uh, hip bone and take it apart. Once again, we've got the ilium, which is the main portion of the hip bone. Um, the pubis, which has the uh, cartilage in it, pubic symphysis, and then the ischium posteriorly. The femur, the head of the femur is going to articulate where all three bones meet at the acetabulum. And you can see the sacrum and the coccyx. So the pelvis is divided into a superior and an inferior portion by the pelvic brim, which is where the abdomen meets the pelvic cavity. And this pelvic brim is going to be uh, a little wider in females, which we'll get to. So we see um, the pelvic brim landmarks like the sacral promontory, the arcuate line, pectineal line, and finally the pubic crest leading to the pubic symphysis. If we go back, um, just to take a quick look, the ilium is the main portion of this hip bone with the pubis and the ischium posteriorly or uh, inferiorly. Okay, the, the area of the bony pelvis superior to the pelvic brim is called the false pelvis and it's the greater, it's a larger piece of bone but it's called the false pelvis and uh, below it um, inferior to the pelvic brim is the true or lesser pelvis. So we see uh, anteriorly um, the false pelvis with the true pelvis posteriorly. Um, there's a pelvic axis, which is the uh, degree um, angle from the coccyx and uh, uh, the pubic symphysis. We'll talk more about that angle when we look at male and female as well. So the false pelvis is more related to the abdominal cavity anteriorly and superiorly and contains most of the small bowels, parts of the colon, some blood vessels. The true pelvis contains some bowels, the rectum, the bladder, and the reproductive organs. So the male and the female pelvis differ in several ways. The bones of the male pelvis are usually larger and heavier, but the female are structured to meet the requirements of pregnancy and childbirth. So the female pelvis is wider and shallower than the male. So you can see this pelvic brim is a lot wider, but it is shallower. So the sacrum is uh, shorter. And the male sacrum and coccyx are longer. They extend almost down to the pubic symphysis. And the female has a straighter coccyx. 
the male's coccyx is curved forward. Okay, so let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. So the female is lighter and thinner. This is the pelvic girdle. The male's is heavier and thicker. The uh, greater pelvis, the false pelvis, the female is shallow where the male is deep. The pelvic brim uh, in the female is wide and more oval where the male is narrow and kind of heart-shaped. The acetabulum uh, is small and faces anteriorly with the female, but is large and faces laterally for the male. And the obturator foramen, uh, it's mainly oval in the female, round in the male, with the pubic arch uh, having a degree of greater than 90 in the female and less than 90 in the male. Okay, just a few more points here. The iliac crest is, um, is less curved in the female, more curved in the male, and the ilium is less vertical than in the male. The uh, greater sciatic notch is wide versus narrow in the male. The sacrum in the female is shorter and wider. The male is longer and narrower. And the pubic outlet, wider in the female, it's a common theme, and narrower in the male. And then finally, the ischial tuberosity is shorter and further apart and projected medially in the female, or is it stronger, closer together, and more laterally for the male. And this all contributes to uh, a wider, more oval uh, pelvic outlet for the female and narrower, more heart-shaped pelvic outlet for the male. Okay, so let's move distally from the hip uh, is the femur. Femur is the longest, heaviest, strongest bone in the body. The proximal end, uh, there's a head, it uh, inserts into the acetabulum of the hip. And the distal end is going to articulate with uh, the tibia and patella. Here on this posterior view, we can see the lateral um, and medial uh, epicondyle and condyle, which is articulating into the, um, the tibia. So the, the kneecap or the patella is a triangular bone that develops in the quadriceps region, um, its posterior surface articulates with the femur. And so we have the posterior surface of the patella here. Um, and uh, it articulate uh, with the femoral condyle. OK, so uh, now we are distally almost at the foot, looking at the tibia and fibula. The tibia's proximal end articulates with the femur, and the tibia's distal end articulates with the talus bone of the ankle. It's one of the largest bones of the ankle. And so you can see here the tibula uh, and the talus Uh, distal to it. So the tibia, the tibia tuberosity at the anterior surface is a point of attachment for the patellar ligaments. And this is uh, proximal back up to the kneecap.
Okay, getting to the foot region, we've got um, the tarsus, and there are seven tarsal bones. These are the talus, calcaneus, navicular, three cuneiforms, and the cuboid. So there is a mnemonic for this as well. Tall centers never take shots from corners. Talus, calcaneus, navicular, third cuneiform, second cuneiform, first cuneiform, and the cuboid. This is a inferior view of the calcaneus showing the ball of the foot. Okay, moving distally, um, we've got the metatarsus, which is made up of five metatarsal bones. And these are just like the metacarpals. They're numbered one through five, and uh, they make up the sole and the dorsal foot, or the dorsal surface of the foot. The proximal ends of the metatarsals will articulate with the cuneiform bones of the cuboid, and the distal ends will articulate with the, with the proximal phalanges. So the phalanges are, are arranged um, just like those in the hand, where the big toe is missing its intermediate phalange. So it has a proximal phalange that uh, articulates with the distal phalange directly without an intermediary that is present in uh, the four subsequent toes. So the big toe has a proximal and a distal phalange, and the other toes have proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. Uh, okay, so there are two arches that are supported by ligaments of the foot. The first is this uh, lateral arch, and there are two portions. There's a lateral and a medial portion of the longitudinal arch. And then there is a transverse arch, which goes uh, across the foot. The purpose of the arches is to allow the foot to support the weight of the body, providing leverage while walking, distributing the uh, weight over the foot. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about development of the skeletal system now that we've finished with the appendicular skeleton. So most skeletal tissue rises from the middle germ layers of the embryo known as the mesoderm. Uh, however, the skull mainly arises from the ectoderm. So the skull bones develop in two ways, and we can split them up into the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. Viscerocranium can contain, can contain the, uh, the nose bones, the maxilla, the mandible, where the neurocranium is going to contain uh, the plates. So uh, cartilaginous neurocranium, which is the hailing cartilage, um, undergoes endochondral ossification, that is through the uh, cartilage model, and the membranous neurocranium undergoes intramembranous ossification. So the bones of the face or the viscerocranium can be divided into two parts. There's also the cartilaginous viscerocranium which comes from cartilage, and the membrane is viscerocranium, which comes from the mesenchyme. Okay, if we look at development of the skeletal system across um, four to eight weeks in the embryo, uh, at four weeks, the limb buds start to form and they extend at, at six, seven, and by eight, you've got uh, free limb buds that have developed uh, into upper and lower limbs.
Okay, and finally, uh, the skeletal system is involved in a number of homeostatic pathways. Uh, the first is using the integumentary system. Bones provide support for the muscles and skin. Uh, muscular system, the bones provide attachment for uh, muscles for leverage. Um, also, uh, muscular contraction requires calcium, which is remodeled through the bone. The nervous system, uh, the skull, uh, protects the brain um, and normal levels of calcium are needed for functioning of the neurons. The endocrine system, uh, since bones store calcium, they need to have hormones that will, uh, will release it and remodel the bone. Cardiovascular, uh, the blood cells, um, or the red marrow carry out hematopoiesis, which is the creation of uh, blood cells. Let's see, lymphatics. The red bone marrow produces lymphocytes by differentiation. Respiratory system. The um, axial skeleton will protect the lungs and the heart. Uh, the rib movements assist in breathing, and some muscles used for breathing attach uh, to the bones via tendons. Digestive system. Uh, we start with the teeth uh, for mastication and um, then the rib cage protects the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, and the pelvis, protects portions of the intestines. The urinary system, the ribs partially protect the kidneys, and the pelvis protects the urinary bladder and urethra. And finally, the reproductive, uh, the pelvis protects the reproductive organs, um, and also bones are very important sources of calcium needed for milk during lactation. Okay, that's uh, this chapter, and um, I will continue tomorrow with the following chapter. Thank you very much.